Are you Joe? Some of you are quite a ways away. Slater is, what state is Slater in? <laughs> Almost North Carolina. Yeah. But we're, we're so grateful to have you all here visiting with us and, and uh, supporting our gospel meeting, which has been really good. Brother Ferris Austin is going to deliver his final installment tonight. And uh, it has been extremely, extremely interesting uh, the way he brings his artifacts here and allows them to illustrate events in the Bible. Um, it really brings a lot of things to light and we're just so grateful for that. Um, Ferris and Margie and longtime friends, uh, Ferris the Elder at the University Church of Christ there in Montgomery, Alabama, there at Falcon University. And uh, we're just grateful that they were able to see fit to run him off for a week uh, to, to come here and, and be with us this week. Uh, so I'm sure that you are going to get a lot out of our lesson uh, this evening. Uh, just by way of a couple of very quick announcements, uh, if you will keep in your prayers, uh, Sandra and Bobby Damaris, they are uh, battling a very severe case of sinus infection. Um, and uh, Sandra has had some sort of reaction to some of the drops that uh, they have given her. Also, Deborah Smith is still in the hospital. Um, Terry Smith's wife, she had to uh, have her colon removed um, and their daughter is in the hospital um, and she had had to have her spleen removed. So please keep that family in your prayers. Also, Susan Luttrell was in the emergency room today. I believe she's on her way home. Uh, she was uh, suffering some heart palpitations earlier today and her doctor sent her over for an EKG and, and uh, they had an IV in, in her for a little while tonight, but from what I understand, they haven't found anything other than uh, mm -hmm. the lower lobe of her left lung. She has some pneumonia, so they've got her on antibiotics for that. So uh, just keep them in the prayers, and, and she's been battling sinus infections uh, for a couple of months now. So hopefully this will get her squared away. Um, following our service tonight, The children wish to express their thank you to Ferris and Margie by having some ice cream and some cake and stuff after our services. I'm sure everyone is welcome. We've got plenty of desserts that are there, um, but uh, uh, the in the it's ice cream and cookies, but there's some other things there also. Uh, they're just so thankful for Ferris and Margie coming here. The kids really enjoy the artifacts. And I don't know if anybody tried to blow your horn, uh, but uh, 
uh, is there. So, uh, in our service tonight, uh, Brother Jeremy Patia from the Edgewood Church of Christ will start us out with our opening prayer, and Brother Dennis Poole will close us out uh, after services with our closing prayer. So, at this time, Brother Jeremy, if you'll open us up. Oh, prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much that you bless us in many ways. Heavenly Father, that we can be here tonight to glorify your name, to learn more about your word. Father, we ask you, Lord, to be with those that were mentioned, those who are sick, those who are struggling. Be with them, Lord. Bless them in every way. Heal them. Maybe you will. Be with those unable to be here tonight. Be with those who are traveling. Be with those uh, brothers and sisters around the world as well, Lord. Be with everyone, Heavenly Father. Father, we ask you, Lord, to uh, bless Ferris and Margie. Uh, be with them, Lord, uh, as they in their travels tomorrow. And also, Lord, for them both, Lord, in many ways, that they've been teaching your truth and been doing all these things, Lord. We ask you to, to bless them in every way, to uh, be with them every second of the day, the things that they do in teaching your word, and also Brother Ferris and showing these things of archaeology to uh, show not only that there is evidence within your word but also even looking around in history that it is there that you are there that your word is true again lord we thank you lord so much and we thank you for again that we can all be here to glorify your name to learn and also to teach you to others as you send we pray amen, amen. Good evening. Good to see everyone that's here tonight. 154. 154. The Bible, store of kindness, sleeping to cheer the wanderer, Lord, in tempest calls. No storm can hide that radiant, peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all my steps in life, and teach me the dangers of these realms below. That lamp of safety or the gloom shall brighten, that light alone the path of peace can show. Give me the Bible, the holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Till night shall vanish in eternal Hold up that slender by the open grave. Show me the light from heaven's shining portals. Show me the glory gilding Jordan's way. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise. Law and love combining till night shall vanish in eternal day. Two one five. Two one five. Hear me when I call, O God, my righteousness, unto Thee I come in weakness and distress. Oh, my 
Yeah. 
come speak to us. Go light your world. Go light your world. There is a candle in every soul, some burning brightly, some dark and cold. There is a spirit his home. Carry your candle, run to the darkness, seek out the hopeless, confused and torn. Hold out your candle for all to see it. Take your candle, go light your Frustrated brother, see how he's tried to light his own candle some other way. Pray now your sister, she's been robbed and lied to, still holds a candle without a flame. Carry your candle. Run to the darkness, sing out the hopeless, confused and torn. Hold out your candle for all to see it. Take your candle, go light your world. We are a family whose hearts are blazing. Let's raise our candles, light up the sky. Pray to our Father, in the name of Jesus, make us a beacon in darkest times. Carry your candle, run to the darkness, seek out the hopeless, Confused and torn, hold out your candle for all to see. It. Take your candle, go light your world. Hold out your candle for all to see. It. Take your candle, go light your world. Take It's certainly a pleasure to be here this evening. We've had a lot of discussion since Sunday morning the uh, Bible class time, and uh, we have looked at a number of lessons, and tonight we're going to kind of wrap all of that up uh, and bring everything back together uh, to some point. Now, I want to thank, again, Joel for his selection of songs. The songs go with the lessons that, that uh, I've been bringing. I want to thank Dennis and Vicki and, and you good folks here for, for inviting us to come. Margie enjoyed her Ladies' Day. Uh, I know that you enjoyed those of you that were here to hear her on Saturday. And uh, it's been a pleasure for me to bring this information to you. Now, we could talk about biblical archaeology and how it illuminates the Bible uh, from now all the way through Christmas and beyond. But we won't be able to do that. So we're just touching the hem of the garment, if you please, in these last few days. There is so, so much material. Now, tonight, what I want to do is um, thank Dennis 
you, you got a good preacher here, folks. You got a good preacher's wife. They're dedicated to the Lord. We spent 32 years in Charleston, South Carolina, before we moved to Montgomery, Alabama, 21 years ago to work with Fulton University. And I retired from there about a year or so ago as dean of students and also working with uh, adult uh, recruitment and so forth. And Margie worked in the financial aid office. So uh, we enjoy retirement. But we're about as busy now as we were when we were working. And that's fine too. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, time goes by quickly. It really does. Over here on this front pew where Joel's sitting, I have uh, some magazines that pertain to archaeology. From this end, the, the, they're, uh, you and I can understand them. Uh, for, as it progresses down, it gets more and more technical about different sites. So if you want to know more about archaeology, and uh, you can subscribe to some of these, just come and get the addresses off of these. Uh, or uh, I'll give you my email address and I'll point you in the right direction. Uh, remember now, these are the artifacts we've already talked about, and these are the ones that we're going to discuss tonight. But before we get to 1 Samuel 6 and a few other things, let me quickly point out a few things uh, for those of you that, that were not here the last day or so. And we do appreciate all of you that are visiting with us. We really do. We're glad that you're here. Uh, this is, of course, a shofar trumpet. Uh, Joel blew it last night. We won't ask him to get a big breath and blow it again tonight. Uh, we talked about, of course, Jericho and, of course, the, the seven priests that blew the trumpets. This is a mud brick, remember? We talked about it last night. The man that made it signed his name by dragging his index finger and second finger through the mud brick. Made of, of course, mud, straw, and animal dung. Uh, this is only eight pounds. It would have been larger out here. We found the wall at that shemish that we'll talk about tonight later on, and after they examined that wall for a few years, they threw the rest of the mud brick to the side, and we could take home what we what we wanted. Remember what happened, of course, when the Hebrews were in Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh took away the straw, so they had a hard time making this mud brick. Of course, they lined the mold with straw so it'd fall out easier. This, of course, is a New Testament Roman first century uh, glass, tear glass bottle. Uh, Romans were working with glass, hadn't perfected it yet, and this looks like two test tubes put together. Of course, you remember what happened there. Uh, uh, folks following a funeral would cry into these. They'd pay the mourners to cry, to shed tears for the deceased, and of course, wives would fill their tears with these when their husbands or boyfriends went off to uh, some sort of Roman deployment or war or whatever, came with a small handle that's broken off here, and they would hang it in their homes and say, sweetheart, while you've been gone, look at all the tear glass bottles I have filled with my tears. And then, of course, someone says, yeah, probably an hour before you got home, they poured water. You know, there's always that case. <laughs> this, is a, this is a first century nail. This nail is the same type of nail. It's not round. The head is round like a roofing nail, but it has four sides, very distinct sides. And this is the type of nail that they would have used to nail the sign above the head of Jesus as he hung on the cross. This is a tablet. A canal form wedge writing here with uh, probably, um, uh, we know for a fact it is Akkadian language. We don't know what alphabet they used, but this was given to me and it dates 1,000 years prior to Abraham. It became much larger than that, of course. This is a pounding stone. It's flat on the bottom. This is what the ladies would have used to pound their grain. A New Testament lamp, a small one. Olive oil here, the wick in there, and it would burn. And this is an Old Testament a lamp, days of Joshua. Um, so this is where the wick would have been. Um, would have uh, been olive oil inside. It would have been used. We discovered a, a whole lot of these, and I was able to keep this one, nick, nicked it on this side. And so that is from the Old Testament. So a big change uh, in evolution of lamps. This is simply a um, uh, bill bill. It comes from Cyprus. It's very thin, and it shows you some of the trade that was taking place. It's found in Israel. You put olive oil in it and pour it, and it sounds like you pour out, you know, a Coca-Cola bottle, two liter, and it kind of burps a little bit. Well, that's the same thing that this does. So archaeologists come up with some real good technical terms. So this is a bill bill. And, of course, these uh, here are uh, uh, carob seeds uh, from uh, uh, the uh, story, of course, of the prodigal son. This is what he was eating when he was feeding the, the, the pigs and the hogs. Uh, has a hard husk very hard 
and they grow on trees. Take as many as you want when you're over in Israel, and you shake it, and you can hear the seeds inside, and they're related to chocolate, but it's very bitter. This is the jawbone of a donkey, the lower uh, part of the jawbone. The rest of it would have been hinged up here. Of course, Samson used this to kill a thousand Philistines, one similar to that. Uh, David fought Goliath. He would have put a, um, it was a sling, probably larger than this. Little Palestinian boys make these over there. And um, on my six trips over since 2005, um, they would, uh, six, they would uh, sell these on the streets. And so I, I bought one of those. And David would have put a sling stone or, uh, in there, five smooth stones that he got from the Valley of Vila, uh, about the size of a baseball. Showed you some pictures last night. Uh, the other day about that, and he uh, slung that to old Goliath, hit him in the head. They should probably stood about 30 to 40 yards apart because they could talk to each other, and it was going almost 200 miles an hour, they suspect. Of course, God's working in that situation, and it dropped Goliath. Now, why did he, five, why did he choose five smooth stones? Well, he needed one. God was working with him. We can only assume uh, that uh, maybe he was going to have to use some more. I don't know. But if you read further in the Bible, you'll see that Goliath had four brothers. Now, I don't know if they were there or not, but in case they came forward, he'd have another stone for them as well. Frankincense and myrrh, spoken about in the Bible, good fragrances and so forth. These are spices that would have been used to put in the folds of the, of the uh, cloth. Uh, when Lazarus was buried, the same way Jesus was buried. They wrapped the, the, the cloth up around their arms, down to their sides, and a separate napkin uh, cloth, as John first chapter 20, uh, chapter 20, beginning of verse 1, tells us, and they put it on his head, wrapped that around his head. Nard, spike nard, remember the story about that last night? That's exactly uh, what the Mary used to uh, uh, wash uh, and anoint the feet of Jesus and wash her, uh, the, the, his feet with her hair. And nard comes from India, and uh, it is still, uh, uh, it's expensive, over $10 for just a little bottle like this in, in uh, the old city of Jerusalem. And, of course, that's the reason Judas made such a fuss, because it was so expensive. Uh, he said, we could use that for other things. Why waste it on the feet of Jesus? But Jesus said, leave her alone. She's doing a good thing. Now, here I'll explain this very quickly. You'll see some of these in the slides tonight as we talk. Philistines painted their pottery. And that's what these little pieces here are. Couldn't bring any big pieces back, because they keep those at the University of Tel Aviv uh, to put things together. You'll see that later on. But Philistines... Canaanites uh, painted their pottery. Egyptians obviously did too. The Israelites did not paint their pottery. You can tell that by any, any of the pottery that you find in, in Israel's, uh, an Israelite strata. This is uh, a realm, part of a, an Israelite bowl that would have been uh, uh, used, but it wasn't fired correctly, and of course it, it broke. This is the bottom end of a storage jar. Found this the last week I, I left. Uh, on my first trip over, found the only thing I hit was this. I didn't know what I had. So this is in the ground, laying there, and it's been in the ground for 3,000 years. And you're the first one to see it in over 3,000 years. So I start out here, and you excavate in, because you don't know what you've got. So I find this thing, I said, what in the world is it? Of course, I get a quick education from Dr. Manor, uh, retired from Harding University in Bible and Archaeology and other PhDs that are there, and I find out this is a four-foot storage jar. It had been turned inside. You can see where the, where the fellow turned it on a wheel, as well as a handle that would have went on the side of it. It's been turned as well. These big handles, you find lots of these over there. Find a number of these. They kept this one, and about 30, to 30 a little over a month later, I received this, and they sent it to Fulton University, um, and, and that, that's, that's how I was able to keep it. They took it to University of Tel Aviv, to the lab that you'll see in a little bit, and they examined it. Now, when you discover anything over there, especially something like this, you have to ask yourself some questions. Okay, uh, this is Israelite, yes, because I found it in Israelite strata. I'm not digging in the, in the Egyptian. I'm not digging in the Canaanite or anything. I'm digging in the Israelite part of Bet Shemesh. Remember, Bet means how Shemesh means sun, 12 miles south and a little west of Jerusalem, and that's where we have the reference of 1 Samuel 6 tonight. So I have to ask myself the question. All right, I find this. It's Israelite. I have to ask myself another question. Who is in Jerusalem as king at this time? King David is there. King David is in 1 Samuel 6. 
uh, there that we'll notice shortly. So he's there in Jerusalem as king sitting on the throne. So you ask yourself another question. The fellow that made this, he's only 12 miles from Jerusalem. King David. Did he see King David? We have no idea. Maybe that'll be answered someday. Storage jar, not liquid in here because if it had been liquid, it would have been seared inside or burnished. And so this would have held, of course, grain. So that's the bottom end of a four-foot storage jar. Here is a flint knife. This is the same type of flint. Has, still has a little edge that the uh, Joshua would have used and uh, his uh, uh, people to circumcise the males before they entered into the promised land. This, you'll see a picture of this up there tonight. This is an austeria head, the face, the top part of a Canaanite goddess. God says destroy these things. And when they destroyed them, nine times out of ten, they cut the heads off of these things when they came through. And uh, uh, they didn't bother with the rest of the body. Usually they just cut the heads off. And these are found throughout Israel. Uh, I didn't find this at Ben Shemesh, though. This was uh, bought through the Israeli Antiquities Authority. Um, beaded headdress, almond eyes, bulging cheeks, very distinctive as you'll see tonight. Here is a little widow's mite right here. Widow's mite. Had to pay $15 for three of them over there in uh, downtown Jerusalem at the Israeli Antiquities Authority. But this is a widow's mite. This is a juglet. Would have held olive oil, came much larger, big jugs, and of course they would have used olive oil for their skin and also for cooking purposes. Found that at Bat Shemesh. This, ladies, is a perfume jar. Has two little short handles with holes in them so they could put some uh, uh, string across, uh, maybe some uh, twine to hold it, and then they had to dip it over and they would have held a perfume, maybe frankincense or myrrh or whatever. They, they would have used. I have some lentil and I have some barley here and these little capsules. We found the last trip I made in 2016, found a lot of these big storage jars over there. This one wasn't fired correctly, you can tell by the edge of it. And have big jars and they were filled with either lentil or barley. So everybody wanted a little bit of that 3,000 year old lentil or barley. So we used the old, uh, had a bunch of these little capsules that you would put film in, and that's what we brought them home. And lastly, this is a Murex shell. These little shells are all over the Aegean Sea along the coast. You can collect these along the coast and attach themselves to the rocks. And what they would do, of course, this is Old Testament and New Testament, really. Um, a lot of it, of course, it's both sides. But they would bore a hole in these little Murex shells and they would get just a few drops of purple dye out of it. Uh, Lydia was a seller of purple. Uh, it was expensive. A few drops of purple dye would take over 800 of these just to make a decent garment. Thyatira, where she was from, was the center in the first century of, of the industry of purple dye. And so that's where your purple dye come, came from back in those days. Of course, it's a lot different uh, in this day and time. Now, let's go, to, um, let's go to the slides. 1 Samuel 6, we'll get to in a minute, but I want to show you a couple of things in review that I wanted to show you that we talked about that I did not show you the other day. This is the Jordan River. Uh, this is a picture was taken uh, about, by, about 2010 when I was over there, and this is kind of what the Jordan River looks like. It's, in some places, not much wider than this aisle. Uh, it's a lot different in the, now in the day, than it was in the days of Christ. Of course, the Dead Sea has dried up. You drive along Highway 90, you look on the rocks on, on the left side as you're headed north. They've got marks up there where the Dead Sea was in 1901, and then in the 30s, and now the Dead Sea is across the highway over there on the other side. So the Dead Sea is literally drying up because they have dammed off, of course, the Jordan River that flows into it and so forth and so on. So we talked about that the other night. Remember the other day I talked to you about the Canaanites, how they buried their children under their floors of their house? Well, that's part of their culture. This is a Canaanite infant burial jar. This came from Ai. Remember after Joshua came into the land, destroyed uh, Jericho, we talked about 
uh, the rehab of Rahab last night quite a bit. And uh, we had, uh, back in 2017, uh, Dr. Stripling, uh, who is uh, uh, ex who excavated for over 20 years, and I uh, had sent uh, over 70 artifacts over to the United States. They've been traveling to different universities. We acquired them for a year, put them in the Furman Curley Library there at Fulton University, upstairs in the Bible building, and made a big display of it. And um, we had it for a year. This was just one of the items that was there. They would put the infant inside there. They had some other pictures. Of course, an animal would come and eat the flesh. And then they also had the picture of the bones that were on the outside uh, in the ground of this storage, of this uh, infant burial jar. Canaanite infant burial jar. See the handle? Similar to this handle up here. Uh, remember the other night? This was in 2006. First time I went over, um, went to Caesarea. Uh, we could talk a lot. A lot about Caesarea. Um, this is a stone, a replica. Now, remember, uh, a lot of secular archaeologists, whenever they dig, they don't dig with the Bible in one hand and the digging tools in the other. They just use the digging tools. But Dr. Mazar and some others over there now, and for many years, some have dug with the Bible in one hand and a petition in the other, because they believe the Bible. Not New Testament Christians, but they go along with the Bible. Well, this has the name of Pilate. The only name that's ever been discovered in the Middle East with Pilate's name on it. And a lot of archaeologists said, we don't believe in Pilate. Don't believe he existed. But when they found this in Caesarea, they changed their mind. So this is a replica. Uh, the real one is in the museum in Istanbul, Turkey. It says, Pilate was the Roman perfect who presided over the trial of Jesus in Nazareth, Matthew 27, 11 through 26. The contents of the inscription and the use of the Latin language hit at the level of how all of this Romanization throughout the province had taken place and in Caesarea at the beginning of the first century. You go to downtown Jerusalem, old city, not the modern city, but the old city of Jerusalem. And this is just one scene of what you'll see. Vendors on both sides, elbow to elbow, very narrow. When we first went over, this is when you first go in. You go in, when we went in at Joppa Gate, you go in, there's a, you can change your money there if you want to, make a left-hand turn, and then you make a right-hand turn, and it's straight down through there, and then it branches off. This is what you see. Vendors on both sides, very loud, and everybody's shouting back and forth, come and buy my fruit, come and buy my garment, da 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 and a lot of them are obviously related. Dale said, y'all step to the side. We did. Stand here. There were about seven or eight of us at the, at the time when Dr. Manor took us there. Close your eyes. So he closed our eyes and said, just listen. And it was on, and the noise was louder, louder, and louder. And all of these merchants are shouting. He says, this is exactly what Jesus heard when he came to the old city of Jerusalem. This is exactly what he heard when he came into Jerusalem. I don't he wasn't there, of course. And that's exactly what he heard. It's exactly what we've heard. And so if you ever go, stand to the side, close your eyes, and just listen for a moment. It's all in Aramaic and, of course, modern Hebrew. This is one of the retired counselors at Fault University that went with us over there. Several professors, of course, uh, went with us. I took a few students with me when I, when I went. This is a, uh, a stone. It may look familiar to some of you, but it's a wine press, and it's in... Uh, the old city of Jerusalem, kind of let you see what it is. Now, at Beth Shemesh, we find five wine presses, uh, made a lot of wine and so forth in Israel. So that's what it, what it would look like. Notice what she's wearing. When you go to Jerusalem, you have to, ladies have to cover their shoulders and, and below have to be covered because you'll go to some of their holy sites and they won't let you in unless the ladies are covered um, because of respect. And so you have to dress appropriately. When you go to Jerusalem, especially the ladies, well, even some of the men, um, you go and dress as plainly as you can. You don't want to draw attention to you. They know you're a tourist. But all this expensive, these earrings and the jewelry and the bracelets, you can leave those at home. Don't even take them with you. This next end of May, 1st of June, in about a year from now, Marge and I are making plans to take our, our two children and our grandchildren over. 
uh, to, uh, to to Jerusalem uh, and to the to Israel. Now we won't be able to take them to, to uh, this ten day tour. We won't be able to go into Jordan. We've been to Jordan, down to Petra, Madaba, Mount Nebo, so forth and so on. Been to southern Egypt, but we're going to go just to Israel, and we're going to travel uh, for those ten days. They'll lose. About Marjorie came over after being in two thousand ten. She lost eight pounds. Now when I go, I stay for thirty days. The full full length of dig, and I work from get up at four o'clock in the morning. Work till, uh, from uh, five to one. And of course, I lose thirty pounds and grow a beard. Nobody knows me when I come home. Uh, literally, I'm Marjorie had twice. Grandkids didn't know who I was. Uh, my mother said, "My goodness, when she was alive, she said that sounds fine. Should have stayed six months." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. Remember, we talked about the. Uh, the, the Dome on the Rock, that's not real gold, by the way. We talked about it the other night. That's the Muslim site. That's the um, Zion, many people believe. This, it, they, the archaeologists believe this is where Solomon had his threshing floor underneath that Dome on the Rock. Jews were allowed up there a few times a year. A lot of violence has taken place up there. But I want you to notice something here. This is a retaining wall. This is the only thing remaining from uh, Herod the Great. Um, he died about six months or so, we believe, after Christ was born. Of course, he's the one that tried to kill all, that did kill all the babies, but Jesus escaped that uh, with uh, his parents. But anyway, this is the retaining wall of the old uh, second temple. Now, not first temple, but the second temple. And uh, this is the Jewish library down here. Um, this is the way you can walk up uh, to that other side if it's open. But uh, this is a big courtyard here. But what I want you to notice are these green, uh, this greenery growing out of the western wall. It used to be called the Wailing Wall. Because the Jews, and they continue to wail there and, and cry and so forth. Um, but this is called hyssop. Hyssop is in the Bible. Hyssop, it's in the New Testament. Hyssop grows on a stick about five feet. And remember what they did when Jesus was on the cross. They put a sop on there with some, what we would know as drugs, to try to kill his pain. And he refused it. But they put it on the end of a hyssop stick. And that's hyssop that's growing out of that wall. Let's move on. Okay, what do a queen, uh, Egypt, the Philistines, the Canaanites, and the Israelites all have in common? Well, they all hung out at Bet Shemesh. Those are the four civilizations there at Bet Shemesh. Um, when Joshua goes into the land, the Egyptians are there, the Canaanites are there, the Egyptians are ruling some areas. We believe, we have evidence, archaeology wise, that a, an Egyptian woman which is very unusual, was ruling the area, kind of like a governor of a province. The Philistines that lay on the Philistine border, 1 Samuel 6, and, um, and other passages, the Canaanites were there, and of course, the Israelites came along. They all, all were there at Bet Shemesh. Tell Bet Shemesh. Tell simply means what? Mound or hill, because one civilization builds on top of another. And here you go, here's your map. There is Bet Shemesh in this center part called the Shephelah, right there. That word is in the Old Testament a number of times. There's Bet Shemesh. And here you have Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath, the five cities of the Philistines. And they were, of course, on the coastal side. Over here you have the Judean hills. You have Hebron, where David had his throne for a while before he moved up here to Jerusalem. And then, of course, you have uh, Gezer up here. Uh, the professor at Gezer, who is, um, has explored the water system at Gezer, is now opened up an archaeology department at David Lipscomb University in Nashville and has a great archaeology department there at, um, at uh, Lipscomb, David Lipscomb University. Of course, they have a new president, like we have it now, at, also at, at Paul University, one of our Christian institutions. And here you have those five cities of the Philistine. Here you have Azika and Soko. This is the Valley of Elah right here. So we're north of that. And um, here you have Timna. This is the Shakur Valley that you'll see in a little bit. This is where they, uh, uh, Samson found his first wife right there in Timna. Lachish, we talked about it last night, where Sennacherib camped out, had destroyed 46 cities of Judah, and was about to march into Jerusalem and so forth. The Shephelah is the most fertile part of the country. That's where they grow a lot of things. It's not as humid as it is over here on the coast, over here in these Judean hills, but it is warm, believe me. Uh, it is warm. Okay. Archaeology, a border community of Judah. This is that Shemesh, just 
about seven. This is an older photograph, but it's seven acres. This highway has been widened. This is part of the town. Bet Shemesh is one of the fastest growing towns in all of Israel. This is where Netanyahu, this is where he was born and raised, former prime minister. And here is where we have been digging uh, since 1990, back in the early 20s. And then in the early 30s, it was dug we, uh, before. And, um, and then it lay dormant from 1933 to 1990 when two professors took it over. Uh, there's that map again, so you've got your location where we are right here in the middle part of the country. Here's a picture of, as you're standing at the dig site, you have the total station that measures everything. Anytime you find an artifact, whatever kind of artifact you find, you leave it in the ground. Leave it in what they call the situ, just leave it in the, in the soil. Remember, archaeologists call it soil, they'll call it dirt. Because you're going to use that total station to locate it, and then you're going to put it on a computer because there's a lot of there's more than just digging. Because when you go back to the kibbutz after one o'clock in the afternoon, you know you got to wash the pottery, categorize it. Uh, you, they've got to take the total station, all that computer stuff, put it into a computer, and then keep records and so forth and so on. And and they're and they're required to write about the expedition. Uh, the two professors are, and also Dr. Manner. Um, I have uh, two volumes of books that are. Books are about that thick. There's two volumes of them. They're quite heavy. Um, from 1990 to 2000, from 2000 forward, they haven't completed them yet, but we'll have those in the future. If you'll note, whoops, let me just show this. If you'll notice up here in this, this is the Shkor Valley. They grow uh, uh, all kinds of things there. The years that we were there, they mostly grew, of course, the um, help me, Margie. What's the uh, uh, the uh, Hummus, uh, chickpeas. You grow chickpeas there. Make hummus. You can buy hummus in your in your grocery store. So that's what they that's what they grew. Up here, you'll see these this odd tree in the little separation. That's where you can go and visit. And we did. That's where they believe we don't know where Samson and his father are buried. Remember now, Samson roamed this area. Samson, this is Samson's area. He roamed the Shkor Valley. There's another picture of that valley. Here you are looking up. Uh, off to the left hand side toward Timna and you can still see some of the modern buildings and over here you've got a kibbutz where we stayed in and you can see the low rolling hills of uh, the Shephelah. At the bottom they have the better one that stays there. He comes up there during the summertime and he, and he uh, stays there with his family. Uh, his wife is covered from head to toe. You just see about this part of her face. She invited the girls down one day for, for lunch. Uh, and uh, he lives there, protects the dig site while we're gone and uh, during the nighttime and on the weekend because we work from Sunday through Friday and we worship the Lord on Sunday afternoon about 4 o'clock underneath the shade tree. All the Christians gather. We have our communion, have our singing, have a little sermon, so forth and so on. But anyway, the better one, and then when winter time comes, he goes further south all the way to the end, uh, of, uh, down to Beersheba, down toward the end of of what we now know as Israel. Here's a little drawing of, of the uh, of Bet Shemesh. This is where we've been digging. This is what they dug over here in the uh, 1900s in, in these areas. Um, but here are the references in the Bible. The territorial border, border of Judah, uh, the tribal allotment of Dan. It was a Levitical town. The return of the Ark of the Covenant, 1 Samuel 6. The Ark of the Covenant comes back. Uh, the Philistines and the Israelites have been fighting a war. The Israelites lost. Philistines had the ark. 1 Samuel 6 tells us, and I'm paraphrasing the story, of course, that what has happened is they have the ark. And, and, and they're going to have to give it up because God's putting a lot of plagues on them. The Bible says they put tumors. God put tumors on them, as well as some other plagues. When you convert that word in Hebrew, it simply means hemorrhoids. Uh, and those are painful. <laughs> um, and so... Eventually, what they do, they put the Ark of the Covenant on a wooden cray, uh, a cart, put two milk cows, take, took their calves away, and let's put it on the road to Bet Shemesh, and let's follow it. So all those five kings hid, those Philistine kings, and they watched it go down, and it landed, of course, in that field that you just saw. Some of the men touched it, and they died. Shortly after that, David's still on the throne in Jerusalem. He moves it up to the northwest part of Jerusalem. It's King Solomon's district. A battle took place there. Uh, 
Jehoiaz, uh, and of course Isaiah. Um, Philistines captured, of course, that Shemesh in the days of Asa. So those are some references, and that's just exactly what I told you there. Um, and the 14th year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria came up all to all against all the fortified cities. We had talked about that earlier over in Second Chronicles. Um, and Sennacherib goes back and he displays his victory on his walls in Nineveh. Here's a picture of Sennacherib coming up, of course, from, from uh, Assyria over here. He comes down and then he attacks all these towns, wants to go into even Beth Shemesh and that mud brick. He burnt part of that. That was part of the wall. And of course, then he goes and tries to conquer Jerusalem, which he besieges it. He does not. We talked about Hezekiah the other night. Uh, there's a cistern there where they collect water. There at Beth Shemesh, as well as other places. The walls are plastered. And uh, here's a picture of the water system. Very elaborate. They knew how to collect water. They knew how to keep it uh, pure and clean. Um, they did a, an excellent job. Wonderful engineers back then. A person down in there finding a jug. A little jug over here. And you'll see here in just a moment. Um, at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the days and the day when the Lord uh, gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight uh, of, of Israel, the sun stands still at Gibeon, and the moon in the valley of Ashkelon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Remember that verse? You remember that battle? God granted Joshua's request so that the battle could continue? Well, I was asked one day to go up to the top of the big site and bring back the Joshua cloth. I had no idea what a Joshua cloth was. Got back and I gave it to some of the uh, workers there. They took it and they stood up behind it and held it up so they could take pictures as if the sun stood still. <laughs> they could take pictures of the big site. This is an older picture here. Now they use a drone. This is an olive press recreation. So when you read in the Bible about their olive oils and everything, this is how they would have that made. And of course, this is a burial site there at Shemesh. And of course, when you go in, you'll see this ledge. They'll lay the body there until the flesh rots away. Then they'll collect the stones and then they'll gather them up. Similar to what uh, Jesus did, but he arose from the dead. Remember, that tomb is empty upon which our faith is based. This is some 8th century pottery, days of Joshua. You'll notice that handle up here in the upper left hand corner, it has a um, picture on it and they would have, uh, Hezekiah would label his his uh, storage jars uh, and, and uh, the handle would indicate that it belonged to the king called a lamellic handle. Uh, this is a, a patrician house, a house of, of wealth, uh, with the items that were found there at Beth Shemesh, like gold. Gold has been found. Not much, but some. There's a good picture of the storage jar and the handles that were on it. Uh, and you can see down here in the lower left, here's your Israeli lamp, Israelite lamp. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Letterman and Dr. Shlomo. Dr. Shlomo died about a year and a half ago. He was one of the great pottery readers of all time in the Middle East. He would take a piece of pottery and he would look at it, and he would examine it, and he would tell you what it was, and he'd show you a picture of it in an assembled uh, jar or vase or whatever. And uh, you can tell a lot about a culture, of course, with all of this pottery that has come out of that Shemesh. Here's more of that beautiful pottery that's found in the reservoir. This, of course, is a chart because when you dig down you begin up here at the Iron Age, um, all the way level three, four, you come down further to the bronze, and of course, then you'll see the middle bronze city wall there at that Shemesh. It's, it's quite detailed. It's more than just digging. You dig slow, and it's very meticulous. Now, uh, pig bones, uh, early Iron Age sites. You see those sites there are all Philistine sites. Pig bones have been found. No pig bones were found at Beth Shemesh because uh, in the uh, Israelite area because the Israelites do not eat pork. 
And then, of course, late Bronze Age sites, more of the pig bones that have been found in those sites. Um, this is a young lady that is doing an articulation of a wall. She is dusting and pulling out the dirt, the soil, from in between those rocks so that when the picture is made, it is very distinctive. We did a lot of that while we were there, standing up and doing that. This is not Indiana Jones stuff, folks. <laughs> this is nothing even close to old Indy at all. Um, we have nothing to do with the Nazis like he did. And let me tell you, he, he didn't do a whole lot of digging either. Um, but you do a lot there when you go on an excavation. Now, you and I like board games. We play board games. We play Monopoly. Well, when you have Monopoly, you've got the little figures, right? Well, let me tell you what they did back then. They had the same thing. Over 3,000 years ago, right here is a, is a game piece, and it says Hanan, H-A-N-A-N, in uh, Hebrew on here. It dates to about the late 10th century B.C., still the days of the judges, and uh, here are some ostracon, pieces of pottery with the writing on it, about the 12th century. When you find any of this, like they did at Lachish especially, it'll tell you a lot about what's going on there. And when you read the Bible, you can read between the lines and kind of see it a little bit clearer. So there you have a game piece, and that game piece, of course, uh, was found at Beth Shemesh. Well, I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Chronicles 27, 28. Over the olive oil, over the olive and sycamore trees, I should say, in the Shephelah was Bana Hanan, the Gadarite, and over the sto stores of oil was Joash. Is that the same person? I don't know. But that name appeared on that game piece, on that game piece, and it's recorded with the same name in 1 Chronicles 27. Kind of interesting. This is kind of a commercial area where they would find uh, items there at Bet Shemesh of all sorts. Uh, this is, of course, Philistine pottery. I have a little bit of that up here. Um, now, here's your lamellic handle. It means belonging to the king. The king would stamp that, showing, don't touch these storage jars of mine because that's my stuff. That's exactly what it means. Uh, it belongs to the king. And so he had some of these in other areas, in case other areas of Israel, in case um, maybe there was a riot and he had to get out of Israel. Well, he'd have his, he'd have his storage jar and have his food waiting for him, but don't mess with it because it belongs to the king. That's the picture of it with that uh, winged uh, uh, item on there uh, belonging to the king. Now, when you find pieces of pottery, you got to take it back to the University of Tel Aviv and you got to put it together. Well, uh, that, that looks like a lot of work to me. And that takes days and days and months and months and sometimes years because you've got to put Humpty Dumpty back together again because when you find it, nine times out of ten, it's not intact. Dr. Bailey went over uh, back in the early 80s to um, uh, Jordan, when he was at Drew University, Jordan, um, Drew University has a dig site they've been taking their students to for years, and he collected pieces of pottery like this, put it in a suitcase, he got back to Atlanta, and they opened a the suitcase to make sure, you know, for security, they apologized for breaking all this pottery. He said, it's broke, put it in there. <laughs> anyway, there's Dr. Shlomo, deceased, but he's putting together this storage jar. You see how it's narrow down at the bottom, and the reason is because they would put these in ships and ship these things over to the Aegean area. Um, and of course, they would bury it in the ground, a little easier when it's when it's in a cone shape. Well, he put this together, he's using masking tape. And then if he thinks, well, now this is exactly where it needs to be. Then he would secure, take the masking tape off, and he'd use Elmer's glue. Because then, if it's still not right, he could still break it off. And change it because of the Elmer's glue. He didn't use super glue. If he did that, it wouldn't come off. This is uh, Dr. Runderman's daughter. Uh, here are some uh, uh, storage jars again as they've been put back together. Beautiful, beautiful jars. A lamellic handle jar and a destructive uh, layer here. You can see this big jar. That's how we found some of the uh, lentils and uh, uh, other things there the, uh, over there in, in the um, in barley. In those in those jars uh, wine set 
Find that in an Israelite area. Strain them. Did the Israelites strain their wine? Philistines didn't. But apparently, with this wine set put back together, perhaps they strained their wine. Here's some earliest known iron workshop. Uh, the other earliest known found in eastern um, the Mediterranean area. This is, of course, at Bet Shemesh, and this is iron. Remember, the Israelites didn't work with iron. They didn't know how, but the Philistines did, and it lay on the border of the Philistines. Did they ask the Philistines to come over and sharpen some of the iron for us? Did you sharpen my axe or whatever? I don't know, but they had to have learned it from perhaps some of the Philistines. So the largest ironworking shop and one of the earliest is found there at Bet Shemesh. Here they are peeling the, the, the floor back as they continue to excavate. They're on their hands and knees and squatting. 06, I can do it pretty good. 2017, after trip number on trip number six, I have a hard time getting down and getting back up too and getting on your knees. But it's meticulous work. You have to break the soil up with a pickaxe, about a half an inch or so, and then get on your hands and knees and excavate. Like I said earlier, uh, the other day, archaeology creates more questions than it does answers. And this is one of them. This is the burial of a donkey found at Bet Shemesh in the Canaanite strata. Now, when you begin to study this, uh, I've done some research on this. Canaanites sacrificed some donkeys um, in their work. There's a number of references to it in the Bible, in the Old Testament especially. This donkey had its back and neck broken. Now you can see the lower part right here, this jaw that we have sitting on the table. Uh, this, is, this jaw came from uh, south of Montgomery County from one of our farmers there uh, that uh, attends University of Congregation. But it's the same type here. So we don't know. It created a lot of questions at the time. Then you have to improvise. Of course here, you know, when you start up here, look how far we're down we, we've come in almost 30 days. Um, this was, is an older picture, but here they're trying to take a picture of some of this mud brick wall that's remaining, some of that mud brick there. Well, they've got a pole here with a PVC pipe on it, and there's a camera right there and that old boy over here, I believe he has the strength that will pull the trigger to take the picture. But we got better than this as time went on. Uh, this is a good sight. You'll see the petition laying here. I forgot to bring my petition tonight. Flat on one side for scraping a wall and pointed on the other for digging. And you're on your hands and knees and you're side by side and you're digging down in a... Uh, in a, uh, an area that's about 10 by 10. Uh, can you see what's here? Jar handles as they begin to appear. Very it's hard to see sometimes, even uh, in person. Dr. Shlomo doing some pottery reading. He tells you about the pottery and what it looked like in the books that he has. <coughs> Another picture, of course, Philistine pottery. An arrowhead, an iron arrowhead that was found. Uh, bead uh, that was found there in an area. You have to categorize these and then describe them in your documents. A crater below this is, this is a Philistine. Philistines built large bowls and, and had uh, an indigenous bird on many of them and de decorated their pottery. Uh, there's a drawing of it and then what it really of course looks like after they put it together. Uh, a chalice that's been found there. A Canaanite chalice from the Canaanite strata. Uh, part of the crater. You can see some of the pristine drawing over here in the side. You can see where they put it back together some. Uh, this, Dr. Manor found this a number of years ago. This is uh, Hebrew. Uh, has to do with a priest. So a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Jar handles. There's my petition. My uh, initials on it. Uh, laying there kind of as a measuring for uh, these jar handles that we find all over. Another jar handle in the center. Pottery laying here. Look at all of this. Now, that takes a while to, to uh, extract from, from the ground. Uh, buckets of soil that you've got to sift 
and put it in a wheelbarrow and then take it and dump it at the end of the, of the dig site after you've sifted. Now they have a wet sift where they wet the material because then you can find even small pieces like this little uh, mite, which you wouldn't find there, and little mite necessarily, but you would find smaller pieces when they do a wet sift. Now here's a here's a, a trowel. They, I don't, uh, this must be a part of a brick here. They, they labeled it. And then this, an opening here, and here you've got a handle still on this uh, vessel. Uh, here's some of your uh, uh, seeds, if you would please. Actually, that's barley that they have found, uh, bringing that out of that bucket. Uh, this is a uh, found in 08. You have to tag everything, no matter what dig site you're at. This is a, a stone, obviously, and it's hollowed out, so a pole would have set inside. Remember when I told you that at, at I, at the exhibit there at, at Faulkner, uh, they brought uh, in a truck and everything was in crates. Well, they brought this crate that was that was humongous. It was a great big old crate. And they had to get it out of the van, put it uh, on the elevator and take it upstairs. Well, when they got it up there to the, to the library, how are you gonna, how are you gonna get this? A 1,500 plus pound stone out of this thing. Well, what I had to do, I just got a hold of five Faulkner football players, those big defensive linemen. I said, fellas, if you'll come up and help me move this thing, I'll buy you a hamburger. Well, they were there in no time. So uh, they just lifted it up. I said, send it right here, and they did. And the same way, when we got ready to pack it up a year later, it would have, in fact, that stone was the stone at the entrance of I. The entrance gate that the big post would have stood in and turned. They didn't put it in the ground to dig its way down. They put it in this in the stone. Oh uh, they gotta dig, they gotta bring some water up. Remember going to Grand Malls and using the uh, the well and the and the bucket and the dipper, like we did in North Alabama years ago? Well, this is the way they did it, and it always didn't work sometimes because those handles, of course, would, would break off. A stopper that would have went into the end of a storage jar. Oh, an axe handle, an axe handle, look at that. 3,000 plus years old and still sharp to a point on the end. Very interesting. Same thing David would use, but it's a little bit larger than a baseball. That is a sling stone. Here we have an interesting find. You can see some of it, it's the lower part of the body of a woman. This is the way it was found. One, two, three, four, five pieces. This, and here's a better picture of it. There you go. This is a drawing of it. This is what it looked like. It was found by a little girl from New York that was over there digging with us about as far from here to the table there. And, and she was in another square. This is an Egyptian woman. This is some of the evidence that we believe that Egyptian goddess, or not goddess, but governor, uh, oversaw this area. She's holding two lotus leaves in her hand. She's got the Egyptian headdress and the figure of a woman, and she is standing on something in the drawing. But notice it is not over here. So whoever made the drawing didn't do it correctly because there's no pedestal here. It's obvious that it's a woman, and it's unusual instead of a man. This is a cartouche that was found there at Beth Shemesh. This is paying homage, whoever made this, paying homage to the Pharaoh in Egypt when Joshua goes into the land. And we believe the Pharaoh was Amenhotep IV. That was the first, second, third, and fourth. And then the fourth, his real name was Amenhotep, but he went by Akhenaten. Akhenaten. And so this is Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, uh, I've studied some of it. I'm not an expert. I'm only an amateur in all of this, but uh, that is paying tribute to the Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, this is a uh, an Egyptian, uh, how do I describe this? Um, it's, a, it's a small object made out of stone, and the Egyptians, of course, uh, paid homage to the um, beetle, the, uh, the little beetle. Uh, and and uh, because it would roll its dung and with its hind legs and so forth and that's what this is paying tribute to 
So this pointing toward more Egyptian influence there at Bet Shemesh. And so the Egyptians thought, well, this little, this little uh, dung beetle is rolling its dung inside the ball of dung is it, are its eggs. And so he'll roll that with his hind legs and they'll always go from, from west to east and he, until those eggs hatch. Well, the Egyptians thought, well, that symbolizes to them the sun going around or around the sky. A lot more to that, but that's basically where it is. Iron sickle blade discovered, uh, part of a chalice. Oh, that's teeth from a cow that was discovered there at that shimmish. More pottery. There's a good picture. You see the wheelbarrows here? Now you've got the sandbags on the wall. So if you walk, you don't break the wall down. A cover over it to help us stay a little cool. Obviously, it's got about break time, got the water bottles, and that's kind of what it, what it looks like. It is not glamorous work at all. That's the reason I didn't shave. Didn't, I wasn't going for a beauty contest at all. And um, there we have lots and lots of dust. And there we have more. There's Dr. Culberson from Hoover, Alabama, Dr. Wheeler, head of the Bible department at one of our Christian schools at, uh, at York College in York, Nebraska. And here are some of the professors back here uh, speaking. Here are the brushes you have to use to clean the floor so the pictures will be taken. More of all of that. This is Dr. Manner from Harding. You may have recognized him. And uh, as they took pictures of it uh, back in the early days, but then, of course, they began Got, had young people to operate the uh, drone that would take its own pictures and wouldn't have to worry about it. Dr. Bubel from Lethbridge University in Canada always brought uh, college students with her so that uh, work could get done very quickly. Uh, I'll go through the rest of these very quickly. These are just pictures. Uh, this, by the way, is a huge bowl. The rest of it would have been inside this wall. It would have been a mixing bowl. I mean, that's a huge mixing bowl for the people that lived there in that Shemesh after they had excavated it. Um, more of the excavation taking place. Uh, you can see this is how far this area here used to be the same height, but now they're down here. Didn't mess with this during that year. Um, have to compare the soil, the muscle scale, that's Dr. Bubel. Uh, what kind of soil do you have? They sent some of the soil off, found out there used to be a pig pen, not a pig pen, but a uh, goat pen here. A lot of goat uh, uh, ingredients in that soil, uh, measuring all of that, looking at it, uh, standing there, scratching your head. What does that go to? What is all of this? There's that storage uh, jar that you see here that they kept. There's a close-up of it. There's your Australia head. God says, destroy these Canaanite goddesses. Fertility goddess, because of where they place their hands, of course. And they cut their cut their heads off, and I have one of them up here for you as well. <coughs> now, as we draw to a close here, this is a Canaanite temple worship area. I was able to excavate some of this. There are three stones you'll see here in a minute. There is a part of that stone that the others don't have that has a groove in it that maybe would have where some of the blood would have flowed out from it as we begin to excavate. As Dr. Manner is standing on part of it. And as you continue to go down one, two, three, and then over here, I think I have a picture uh, of an area where they brought, brought the cattle in. Ooh. There I am on my hands and knees, my petish. I don't have my knee pad because those old knees don't, don't work as good as they used to. And uh, I'm excavating there at the uh, Canaanite um, uh, temple. And this is where they probably would have led the cattle through as we excavated and as they're measuring. And as he's got his hands on his head with a lot of questions, of course, and some of the pottery and things that we found, we found chalices there. Everything that we found, found there so far through 2016 and even in 17 when they finished it up uh, was related to a temple uh, there. But there's part of the chalice that we're holding. And uh, there's the other part of it. Um, there's a handle with some uh, Philistine writing on it. There's another one, storage jar, Philistine pottery, up close, Philistine handle, little beads, and I think, oh yeah, we found some, of course, uh, some uh, zephoric uh, uh, vessels 
in the shape of uh, animals here, except for this. This is a figurine similar to the one that was found earlier, that female. And then here's a storage, uh, a perfume jar similar to the one that I have here. This was not found at Bet Shemesh. This was from Ai. But this belonged to the Egyptians. The Egyptians, ladies, would darken their eyebrows and they would use soot. And that's exactly what would be on the end of that. There's your uh, Murex, Murex shell, uh, where they would bore the hole in there. This is a little, look at how small this is. Uh, what is this? Well, it shows here a man over here, and you got four legs, you got an animal here. Is this Samson and the lion? Someone made this. He was well known. You've got mosaic floors in northern <coughs> part of Israel showing pictures of Samson as the way they depicted it. It's called the little Samson uh, um, vessel that they found. Very small. Uh, another picture of it. There's the, there's the animal. And there's, is that Samson on this cartouche standing on top of a lion that we found? He roamed the area. This is his part of his home. And here's a part of a, of, of a bull uh, that we found. Uh, then, of course, as we close here, 2014, there's a pen. There's the size of the little uh, piece that we found. And when you uh, are rolling out on a piece of clay, you can see what it says uh, through there. So, of course, the, uh, the uh, flint stone, a flint, and then there's a thumbprint of an individual that signed that particular uh, handle. And then, of course, the, the uh, part of a, of a stone that it still remains there, part of the roof of a, of a house there. Uh, reading the pottery back at the kibbutz and the picture of the Mediterranean Sea with the sun setting and that is the end. So there's a lot of information in a quick period of time but these items that we have here tonight kind of give you a little bit more of a vivid picture of what life and the culture was like in the Bible whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. We don't need these to prove the Bible. We are like Rahab. We accept it by faith. And her faith was strong. Our faith needs to be strong as well. So, these things illuminate the Bible. These things, when you read about Rahab and the walls that fell outward that we talked about last night. When you read about 1 Samuel 6 and about the ark coming back to Beth Shemesh, this is the area, this is the place. And if you go to Israel, you can go by and visit these things. It's easy. Your driver's license is good in Israel, by the way. And you can just rent a car, and they drive on, on the same side of the road. Thank goodness that we drive on. Right? And you can just go and come as you wish. You can go to the Red Sea, southern Israel. You go to Masada. You can go up to Galilee. You can see the there in Galilee, when you go to Capernaum, where Jesus spent a lot of time, you'll see what remains of Peter's house. It's large. Because it was Peter was there with his wife and his mother-in-law. James, John, Jesus, they were all there. It's a large house. And you'll see a, uh, a Byzantine, what's left of a Byzantine synagogue, but underneath you'll see uh, several feet of a first century synagogue because Jesus spoke at that synagogue the Bible says and then he walked about 30 yards to Peter's house it's the same area it's the same place on the Sea of Galilee go up there and see the Jesus boat hundreds and hundreds of places and Israel is small about the size of New Jersey you go from one side to the other and no time north and south in a, in a day's drive easily we've driven <coughs> A number of times. Israel is a great place, but the Bible is even greater. The Bible is the true Word of God, and that's exactly what we need to be focused on all of the time. I know this country's having problems, like you know. We've got things going on that we don't like, but things have happened that we pray, and if we pray, that's what we need to continue to do pray for the church, to pray for his kingdom, to pray for this country, to pray for one another, and to uplift and encourage one another 
and to pray for prospects of individuals that know not the true Christ in which we can teach. And I'll end with this. I want you to pray for Cuba. I've been there six times. Communist country. Been there on six trips, uh, mission trips. It's only 90 miles off our coast. They have 5,000 Christians plus in Cuba right now. They have a, a, a large, the largest churches in Matanzas, where we go, 90 miles from Havana. Havana has about 150 members. Matanzas has over 350. Not in a church building like this, in an open air place. Tony Fernandez is the preacher there. His father started that congregation back in the 30s. I won't go into the details about how it began. We can do that at another time. And, and how we got in in the late 80s when Castro was in, in office, was in power. But I asked Tony, I said, Tony, I'm going back to the United States. When I get to come back, what do you want me to bring? What do you want, what, what do y'all need over here? He looked me in the face and said, Ferris, the only thing we need is prayer. Just pray for us. We're under a communist regime. We have a good relationship with the government. We'll go into all of that, how that happened. But pray that we'll continue to preach the gospel and to increase this congregation and others in the area. We went out and visited the province, rural areas. People that live in, a, in, in small shacks. Everybody has electricity in Cuba. They may have one light bulb, but that's all they've got. They're in poverty. At the, the country is, is going downhill. They don't allow shortwave radios over there because they don't want the people to know what's going on in the, world, in the rest of the world. Well, took in a whole suitcase full of them, they arrested him, and he's still in jail as of seven years ago. So brothers and sisters, pray for Cuba, pray for those in the Ukraine, pray for those all over the world, pray for those that you're helping uh, uh, in, in your mission work, wherever they may be. Pray for one another, pray for the congregations in this area, because brothers and sisters, there's power in prayer. Hezekiah found that out, as we talked about the other night. <laughs> If you're not praying, shame on you. Publicly is one thing, but privately is another. There's power in prayer. You want to change the world? I want to change the world. I'll tell you how you can change it. By converting one person at a time. Bringing one person to Christ. You know, how, you know enough to become a Christian, and you know enough to teach someone else. I pray that you will. We're living in Montgomery, Alabama, where... Congregations are very prevalent. South Carolina has some 85, 90, last time I counted, kind of congregations in the whole state. Lauderdale County, North Alabama, Florence area, where my parents grew up, where I'm from, 90 congregations in one county. Shows you what the Bible taught you. Doesn't matter where you are. If you're overseas anywhere, you're right here. Pray for the Lord's work wherever you are. If you're wayward, if you need rehab just like Rahab did, if you need to change your life like she did, you need to come forward. Jesus standing here with his arms outstretched just like the prodigal son we talked about the other night. And he wants you to come back to him to, to your first love. You haven't named him as your savior. You're not guaranteed this moment, much less tomorrow. Make it right. Well, you have an opportunity. Once you come, let's together we stand and sing. Today is the day of salvation.
so very much. Uh, I've already called the hotel and once you get in, your doors will be nailed shut. <laughs> Vicki and I, both, she mentioned last night, we uh, really miss you all when you're at home. So we're not going to let you. Um, and that flint knife I was kind of interested in. Uh, I'd have told Josh, well, I'll just wait here and just send me a postcard. But uh, I deeply appreciate it very much. It was a uh, very enlightening the work that is involved in, in all of this and not only that but to be able to give life to the words that we read and that is so important um, I just a couple others I know in October the Slater Marietta is out holding a youth rally is that correct? on the first gospel meeting second and third okay. Okay. very good very good. So I'm sure that uh, congregations will have uh, uh, that uh, there for you. So um, cookies and ice cream and maybe some cake. And uh, so if you like to, the kids would like to really honor you in that way. Um, but this time we'll be yes. just, oh, go ahead. One thing I wanted to mention, I didn't say anything about it all week because I want to make sure it's working. But our lessons our services are now on facebook live on the Malden church page and we're working on getting them on uh, youtube and also on our website so if you want to go back and watch any of the lessons that brother ferris has presented this week uh, please check that out if you need to ask any questions ask me and again if you'd like to check out some of these artifacts and come up after we close with prayer then uh, uh, feel free ferris will be able to explain a lot better. This time, Brother Dennis Poole will dismiss us for prayer. They will pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. This opportunity we've had tonight to come out with our Christian brothers and sisters in this gospel meeting. We thank you, Father, for the speaker, for the knowledge that he's brought to us here, for the artifacts that to us as Christians we already know that the Bible is true and it is complete. Father, we thank you for this congregation here in Malden, for Dennis and Mickey and the work they're doing here, and for all the members. We pray for the Lord's Church throughout the world, especially, Father, for those that may be in countries where they're being persecuted or don't have the same freedoms that we share here, that they would continue to be able to withstand the trials that they go through and be able to remain faithful in the preach your word and teach your word wherever they're at. Lord, we thank you for the Lord Church here in the United States and we pray, Father, that it too would be able to continue to teach the truth and many would hear and obey the gospel. We pray tonight, Father, for those that are mentioned that are sick and have special needs that those needs may be taken care of. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come out and worship you and first day of each week with freedom without fear of persecutions in this country. We pray tonight, Father, for our leaders, the rulers throughout the world, that they might rule in a way that would allow us to live in peace, that they might use your word for the guidance and the judgments that they make. Father, we pray now that as we leave this place, that we continue to remember you and that we do continue 
in prayer each day and in Bible study each day. Be with us, forgive us of our sins, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.